Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, I'm going to do kind of like a mixed bag of different just little items, little topics that I've been thinking about. Um, we're going to talk about where the First Presidency and the Apostles are meeting since they aren't meeting in the Salt Lake Temple right now because it's under renovation. Uh, later in the video, we're going to talk about the Salt Lake Temple and some updates as far as the uh, reinforcement of the foundation, um, how that's going, and just a thought that I had about that. I'm going to talk about Iran, going to talk about um, a recent world record of oil lamps, uh, which I thought was very interesting, very timely. I'm going to talk about John the Revelator and John the Beloved, um, and then also Gog and Magog. Just because with those things, it seems like there's some confusion. I, I, I thought it would be worth it to bring it up just to clarify for anyone that may not know. And then I wanted to read a little bit further about the, the final war. Okay. So just a whole bunch of things. So first I got this email from Susan J. Lambert. She says, Hey Jared, I remember making a comment on one of your videos that, or sorry, I remember you making a comment on one of your videos that you wondered where the prophet and apostles, etc., met, met for their weekly meetings while the Salt Lake temple is being renovated. Yeah, because normally uh, they would meet on Thursdays in the Salt Lake Temple, and the Salt Lake Temple has a special room for them to have their meetings. I thought you might be interested. Uh, Bishop Budge from the presiding bishopric, oh gosh, sorry, uh, was at our state conference this past weekend, and he told us that when they meet with the First Presidency, they meet on the eighth floor of the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. He said it has been dedicated as a temple for that purpose. Now that is that is interesting. Of course, you know uh, this is coming from Susan. I don't doubt that she's lying. Um, can't verify that, but I, I think that she's right and that she's telling us the truth. Um, if you don't know where the Joseph Smith Memorial Building is. This is part of um, the two blocks that make up Temple Square. And uh, well, they're, th what they're really doing with the upgrades is they're intending to tie this all this entire thing in together and essentially have this all be Temple Square. Whereas before it was primarily the, just this block right here that had the temple, the tabernacle, the visitor centers. But they're wanting to basically extend it. Uh, they kind of did that before by uh, purchasing this part of Main Street and making it a plaza, but they're intending to incorporate this over here to the east more into Temple Square and this becoming part of Temple Square, um, based on what I've read. And so on this side, you have the church office building, you have the administration building, um, which has the offices and stuff for the apostles and first presidency you have the release society building up here and then you have the joseph smith memorial building oh and i can't i can't forget there's also the the beehive house or the sorry the lion house um it was brigham young's uh residence while he was prophet so this right here this is the joseph smith memorial building uh it is beautiful inside it has been used for many different things at one point it was a hotel um but the, the main floor <clears throat> is really beautiful, has these big columns inside. And so um, I've been here a number of things. There's a couple, I think there's two restaurants up top. I've never actually been to them, but I know a lot of people that have. So she's saying that for this building right here, the eighth floor, has essentially been dedicated um, as though it was a temple so that they can have their meetings that's really interesting. That's really, really interesting. Okay. Oh, it's going to freeze up. So let's go back. Okay. She says, I thought that was so cool. It just reinforces in my mind that the Lord can take any building or part of a building and sanctify it for his purposes. So why not the visitor center in Jerusalem and or Missouri? Well, I think I think she means the uh, BYU Jerusalem Center, and then the, and then also the Visitor Center, uh, in Independence, Missouri. She says, "I think you're spot on, spot on. At least I hope you are." Laugh out loud. Thanks for all the time you spend creating your videos. 
it's got to be so time consuming. Susan Lambert from Madison, Alabama. Yeah, it is time consuming, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm making money from this and this is basically my job now. Uh, I still do graphic design, but yeah, it takes a lot of time, but it, it's really neat. It's an amazing experience because I get to just dive into all these things that I've been so curious about and I, I keep discovering new things that I didn't know about. And I'm, I'm wondering how many more things there are to be discovered that have been out there somewhere, whether it's in a conference talk or Journal of Discourses or wherever. Um, it's, it's amazing. So thank you, Susan Lambert. And uh, that is a really neat thing that they're meeting in the uh, Joseph Smith Mem Memorial Building. Okay, <clears throat> let's move on. So we got Iran. This is a... This is an article from today. Iran is on the brink of revolution or war as the siren outside goes off, the daily siren at noon. Okay, so we've been talking about this for a while, um, for at least like a week or two, about how Iran is going through uh, what very well could be a color revolution. I've, I've talked about the color revolutions how it seems like maybe let's see i'm going to pull up the map here maybe the west has been has been um using this method to change governments and that may be uh, what caused the arab spring anyway i did a video on this a couple videos back that talked about this more at length but i ran okay it seems like it's the last according to a a plan uh, that they had a while ago. And um, let's see, a day ago, Tehran, uh, Karun, Mortsavi, intersection, angry locals attacked a plainclothes agent. Security forces shot tear gas and pellets at protesters. Yeah, the, the country is erupting into protests. And um, it's kind of, there have already been protests for a while because of um, water shortages and uh, power blackouts in the country. But there's this new event that happened this year where there was a 22-year-old woman that was arrested uh, for not wearing the hijab or not wearing it correctly or something like that. And uh, she died while in custody. And that has been kind of like a... Well, it, it seems to me like it's kind of like a George Floyd-type situation uh, where she's like the, you know, the the face of this revolution or, or this protest, which seems to be turning into a revolution, according to this article, uh, New York, the Sun. Iran is on the brink of revolution or war. So I wanted to share some of this, some of these thoughts from this article. Many outside Iran are wishing the protesters success and hoping for a revolution. That means that they have not learned the lessons of Syria. As long as a regime is committed to defending itself, revolutions either die or devolve into civil wars. And we had every reason to believe, and we have every reason to believe that the Islamic Republic will not give up power. I guess I should pull up that map too. So after we had um, the Arab Spring, part part of the Arab Spring included Syria. And Russia stepped in uh, to uphold the Assad uh, regime and government. But ever since 2011, uh, Syria has been in, in a state of civil war. Uh, the area that uh, uh, Assad controls is this red area here. I'm not sure about these black areas. I don't know if ISIS is still around or not, but I would imagine that's maybe what those are. And then the green is rebel forces. So you can see you have rebel forces up in the north. In fact, there's a key for it. Let me just turn this on. Green, rebel forces, black. Oh, yeah, black is Islamic State. So I guess they're still kind of around. They controlled a very large area, if you'll recall, both in Syria and Iraq. Um, yellow up here, this is Kurds. Okay, so anyway, uh, this is one that I, I don't know what would have happened if Russia hadn't stepped in. 
Um, I haven't followed it closely enough, but I'm assuming that it helped. And as you can see, they're still in power uh, over a large portion of the country. So anyway, Iran. Iran. It looks like this is the next one on deck. And let's see what these guys say. So the capacity, okay, these are the three things. One, the capacity for violence. Two, a will to fight. And three, uh, uh, irreconcilable political difference are the three, or political differences are the three ingredients of a civil war. The capacity for violence, a will to fight, and irreconcilable political differences. Iran, uh, Iranians are radicalized and increasingly engaging in political violence. Over the past five years, there have been three rounds of major revolts, each more violent and larger in magnitude. Discontent is present even among the security forces, including the rank and file of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, Artesh, Iran's regular military, is even more prone to sympathies with the people. As political violence grows in Iran from both sides, eventually many in the rank and file of security forces will defect. They have guns, and they are trained. Alright, skipping down. The three necessary ingredients for a civil war are coming together, and it might not be long before a spark sets the country on fire. This is after talking about how there are there's a black market and guns have been uh, procured um, from specifically from Iraqi uh, Kurds okay across the border there let's look at the map so Iran is right next to right next to Iraq and the Kurds are up here in the north so probably over here in this area they're getting weapons according to to this um the first time the regime faced an existential crisis was in 2009. I was one of the millions of protesters at the time, though I was one of the few radicals. At the time, people hoped for incremental change. In the 10 years since I have left the country, Iran has changed beyond recognition. The polity uh, that that wanted, sorry, the polity that wanted a reformist president and was appealing to religious symbolism for its political objectives has transformed into a secular society secular society desiring regime change. In 2009, Yah Hossein, Mir Hossein was the most popular chant, one that perfectly encompassed both religious, religious and reformist themes. Yah Hossein invoked Shiism, uh, third imam, or Shiism's third imam in a symbol of martyrdom, and Mir Hussein, uh, named after the saint, was the reformist candidate. So he's saying back then in 2009, it had not gotten to this point where it's all about secularism and wanting to throw off the, uh, you know, the, the, the people that are in power uh, that have this religious theme. Today, only 5% approve of it, of the former chant, Yah Hossein, Mir Hossein. A new one has replaced it. Reformist or principalist, it's game over. In another rejection of Islamist policies, quote, neither Gaza nor Lebanon, my life is only for Iran, has become a popular protest slogan. So I'm assuming that that is in reference to Iran uh, antagonizing Israel, supporting Hezbollah, right? Which I think a lot of Hezbollah is in Lebanon, in southern Lebanon, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, this seems to be referring to they're they're tired of um, the regime, you know, doing these things against Israel. It's like let's stop worrying about Israel, let's just focus on ourselves. That, that's how I read that. Uh, the Iranian people today are secular, rep repressed, and poor. Their leaders are religious, powerful, and corrupt. 
It doesn't help that pictures, videos, and reports of the lavish lifestyles of the elites regularly circulate among Iranians via social media. Sporadic protests increased in the years after the nuclear agreement until it climaxed in 2017, the most violent protests since 1979. And that was the the revolution that put the current regime in place. Uh, it's interesting, 2017, all the things that happened in 2017, well, here's another one of them. In 2019, an even larger and more violent protest move movement erupted, uh, resulting in the murder of 1,500 Iran- Iranians in just one week. The regime only managed to end the crisis by shutting down the internet completely. Ever since, violence and cutting off the internet have become the regime's go-to tricks for protest control. Okay, just a little bit more. With both sides more willing than ever to engage in violence, a civil war, much like Syria's, is becoming likelier every day. That is a stunning possibility. Uh, Just because for so long, you know, for so long, Iran has been pretty much the main enemy of Israel and has caused so many problems. Iran has been the topic of national security concerns for a long time. Uh, It comes up in presidential debates. So the idea that what has happened to Syria may also happen to Iran or even more, is it's mind-blowing to me. And I, I don't know what the implications are for Israel. Because like I said before, uh, with both Russia and with Iran, it's like, I don't know if what's going to happen is a flip-the-board moment. And what I mean by flip-the-board, if you've ever played like a game like Risk... <laughs> or Axis and Allies, or some board game. Um, you know, it, it's it's not unheard of that sometimes a player will start to lose a lot of ground, a lot of uh, territories and country, and then uh, as they're playing with their friends, and then it gets to a point where um, the person just gets so mad that they flip the board, and then the game is over. <laughs> and I'm not saying that I've ever done that, uh, I will never, I will neither uh, confirm or nor deny that. But uh, seriously, I wonder if that's a possibility with both Russia and Iran, uh, and it's really dangerous. It's really dangerous, especially with Russia, because the war is not going very well. It, it seems to be getting worse every day, and it doesn't seem like there's any easy way out for Putin. So is he going to have a a flip the board moment where he just decides to do something rash? Uh, or Iran, as they as they start to lose control, if this is successful, if it does turn into a civil war, will they be like, well, we're going out. Let's uh, go ahead and give it, you know, a shot and let's try and take out Israel. Don't know. These are very complicated things when it comes to geopolitics and international happenings and war. It's very complicated, and uh, there's not usually very many people that know exactly what's going to happen. So anyway, let's continue. Um, Let's see. the The regime intervention in Syria, not just... Okay, the regime intervened in Syria... Yeah, because not only Russia, but Iran as well has been in Syria. The regime intervened in Syria not just to save its ally, but also to make a point to Iranians about how far it is willing to go to preserve its own power in Iran. They've made it clear that they would turn Iran into Syria before they lose power. For better or for worse, the Iranian people seem to have understood that point and taken to the streets anyway. Civil war is a risk they are willing to take. Those who hope that protests in Iran will overthrow the regime on their own without external assistance are fooling themselves, just as they are wrong to think that these protests as a women's movement or about, okay, 
just as they are wrong to think that these protests are about a, a women's movement or about compulsory hijab. We are witnessing a revolution, and if the American government won't ensure that it succeeds, civil war will break out. Well, I mean that that's your opinion. I, again, I don't I don't know what what would have happened to Syria if um, if Russia hadn't stepped in or Iran. You know, may, maybe they would have succeeded. I, I don't know. It's really complicated. Again, we were talking about the we were talking about uh, ISIS as well. They they kind of filled in. Um, they there was a power vacuum and they kind of came to power. I don't know. I don't know if that's a correct assessment. Maybe the the Iranians will be able to have a, have a successful revolution without any outside help, or not the tie, or at least not to the extent that this article is suggesting. I don't know. Anyway, that's something to to watch. Okay, as far as the signs of the times go. Now, uh, there's this political article, Politico article, talking about the drought. Uh, this is the outlook for this winter, 2022. And uh, let me zoom in here. These brown areas uh, that represents drought areas that are likely to continue or get worse. And you can see it's a pretty sizable portion of the country. Um, light brown and green are better. Um, yellow is not good because it's like it, it's uh, developing, like the drought is developing in those areas. So we're looking at Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, parts of Louisiana. Um, just wanted to read a few things from here. Drought has engulfed large swaths of the country, threatening parts of the nation's food and power supply, and it's getting worse. Now look at look at this one right here. More than 80% of the continental U.S. is experiencing unusually dry conditions or full-on drought, which is the largest proportion since the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration began tracking 20 years ago. So... Uh, that's something to stop and take notice of. Okay. The worst since it started tracking 20 years ago. Um, the 22-year mega drought in the West has deepened so much that it's now considered the driest in at least 1,200 years. Yeah. And we, we've we've known that. They, they said that a while ago, that this mega drought is the worst in 1,200 years. Um, something we should probably pay attention to. Authors of a recent study in the Journal of Nature Climate Change found that 42% of the drought is attributable to human-caused climate change, confirming experts' worst-case prediction for the current level of global warming. Meteorologists are also attributing the dry forecast to a third straight winter of La Nina, a complex weather pattern where strong trade winds churn colder water to the surface of the Pacific Ocean and push the jet, jet stream north, uh, which has only happened a few times in the last half century. As the planet continues to warm, rare weather events like mega droughts are becoming increasingly common, along with 1,000 year floods and record smashing heat waves. Scientists warn that unless the world dramatically reduces its carbon emissions, extreme weather and the toil and the toll it takes will become the norm. Well, scientists, that's that's good. But how about this? <clears throat> what if the world needs to dramatically uh, decrease its sin? How about that? Maybe maybe that has something to do with uh, these things that are happening happening in nature. These natural disasters and droughts and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to tell you how to think, but I think that I personally think that maybe that would improve our conditions a lot better if, if the world became more righteous. And, um, you know, we're not going to know until Christ comes. Maybe science is right. Maybe this is human caused. Maybe it's not. I, I've suggested before that maybe this is simply the earth preparing to level up 
to become a terrestrial world, return to its paradisiacal glory. Right? Don't really know, but um, yeah, I think the I think what we need to focus on more is our our levels of righteousness. Okay, now this was interesting. This came up today um, as I was looking through Flipboard. Uh, this article actually came out yesterday. It says India's display, India's okay, India states display of 1,576,955 oil lamps breaks world record. Here's a picture of it. That is pretty incredible. Um, a state in India broke a Guinness World Record when it created a display of 1,576,955 oil lamps to celebrate Diwali. Um, I'm not saying that this is necessarily a sign, but just like how we read that article a little while ago that 2022 is being called the year of marriage because there's there's a lot of people that delayed getting married because of the pandemic until now. So there's like a, a bunch of marriages taking place this year. Marriage being a sign of the second coming. Well, oil lamps, that's also a sign of the second coming, or that's a, a symbol uh, associated with the second coming, specifically because of this. Right? Everyone knows the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, this is a... Seems like it's becoming a, a, a popular painting. Um... And no disrespect toward the artist, but this one right here, th this is a guy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is straight up a dude um, that looks like his name is Steve. <laughs> I don't understand. How, all the rest of them are just very like feminine. And then you get to this one. This is a this is a guy. You know, it looks like he has like a short haircut. Looks like someone that you would see in the office, you know. Um, what what is Steve doing? <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Um, oil lamps, right? We need to have our oil lamps full. We need to have extra oil for our oil lamps. And so I, I do think that the Lord likes to use different things throughout the world as signs, uh, just to kind of put it in your mind. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe this was inspired by that, by by the times that we're living in. There's a video. Oh, it's not showing it. Let's see. There we go. Here's a video. I'll put this in the description below so you can see the, the oil lamps, but it looks pretty amazing. Um, Oops. These oil lamps that they're using, though, they're, it's not the same. Uh, these are called Diaz, okay? And they look like this right here. Whereas um, the oil lamps that the, that the Ten Virgins, like back in the time of Christ, that they would have been using if it was a literal story, uh, more look like this where they have like a, like a cover there's like these two holes you know one where you put oil in i guess and then the other one where the flame is lit so it's not the same type of oil lamp but it's still just kind of it's kind of interesting you know 2022 the year of marriages 2022 the year that the oil lamp uh record is broken so i don't know just something to think about I also came across this. I'll put this in the description below. I'm not going to really cover it, but I found this kind of neat. Uh, it's actually, there's not much here in the article. It's mostly, it's, it's mostly this uh, YouTube video right here. What's hidden under the ice of Greenland. You all know that I'm not, I'm not a proponent of the main body theory that there's a main body of the 10 lost tribes, but I'm not going to be, um, I'm not going to say that it can't, happen or that I may misunderstand it or that it's a possibility. I just think it's very, very unlikely based on my own studies. But for those of you that uh, that's your theory, you might want to check out this video. It talks about the fact, I didn't watch the whole thing. It's like 20 minutes long, but it talks about the fact that there's a huge canyon 
uh, underneath the ice cap here in Greenland, uh, larger than the Grand Canyon. Um, so I guess one theory goes that they could be here underneath this uh, ice sheet, right? I think I think they said something like the ice sheet is like a kilometer or more thick. Um, I don't know, but you might want to check this out. It, it may be of interest to you if you're a main group person. Okay, um, now I wanted to talk about John the Revelator and John the Beloved. Um, and I'm not meaning to, to embarrass anybody. I'm bringing this up because I've heard different things like throughout the entirety of this channel. Sometimes things will come up and people will be like, well, you know, like in this case, uh, you need to know that John the Revelator and John the Beloved are different because this is when I was talking about the three Nephites and um, how John is also translated and presumably uh, fulfilling a similar mission to the three Nephites. So someone brought up, they're like, well, John the Revelator and John the Beloved are different. Um, I just wanted to bring up that, no, they're, they're actually the same. Um, I, I pulled this up. This is from August 1995 Friend magazine. And it says here, one of the apostles of the Lord who is well known for the revelations he recorded is John the Revelator, also known as John the Beloved. So uh, it is the same person, and uh, this is the one that that was translated. So in case you had that question in your mind, anybody, there you go. It's They're the same. Um, another one that's come up, this has come up a number of times on the channel uh, since the very beginning. Uh, there, there seems to be confusion about Gog and Magog. Okay. Uh, normally, what I'll get is I'll have like a comment that says that no, the the war of Gog and Magog doesn't happen until after the millennium. So let let me just I want to clear this up. This is in the this is in the Bible Dictionary. Um. Well, let me just read this whole thing because it's short. Okay, Gog. King of Gog, or sorry, King of Magog. So Gog is a person. Uh, we also read that it could also refer possibly to a group of leaders rather than just one individual. Anyway, Gog is the King of Magog, which is the country or the alliance of countries, whose invasion of Israel was prophesied by Ezekiel. The prophecy points to a time when the Gentile nations of the north would set themselves against the people of God and would be defeated and led to recognize Jehovah as king. All this appears to be at the second coming of the Lord. Another battle, called the Battle of Gog and Magog, will occur at the end of the thousand years. This is described by John in Revelations, uh, Revelation chapter 20 and also DNC 88. Okay, so there's two there's two battles or wars. Um, I'm not, I'm never sure why. I, I don't know if it's just like, you know, we know that Armageddon is a battle within the war, but the, everything that I read, it seems like the, the war of Gog and Magog is a war, not a battle, but that's what everything that I've read suggests that. So I'm not sure why they're calling it a battle because a battle is a part of a war. But anyway, here it says another battle. Um, there's also this right here. This is in uh, Old Testament seminary student guide, the battle of Gog and Magog. Let me just read this. Ezekiel 38 chapters 38 and 39 speaks of a great battle that will occur in Israel in the latter days, and that will involve a people from Magog, led by a king named Gog. Ezekiel described this war as being waged. See right here, it says war. Just, I wish that was, I really, I just wish that it, that was clarified, and because I think that that can be confusing. Uh, Ezekiel described this war as being waged in the mountains of Israel against the children of Israel <clears throat> gathered to these lands. The Lord also told Ezekiel he would miraculously save his people from the armies of, God, of Magog so that all nations may, quote, know that I am the Lord. 
Because of these descriptions, Ezekiel seems to be describing the great battle before the second coming, commonly known as Armageddon. Uh, what can be confusing is that John the Revelator described a battle between good and evil at the end of the millennium as the Battle of Gog and Magog. So there are two battles referred to as Gog and Magog, the first right before the second coming and the other at the end of the millennium. They are similar in that they will, they will be massive battles involving great destruction that completely destroys the enemies of God and makes significant changes in the earth. All right. So we have both the Bible dictionary as well as the seminary student manual um, clarifying that. And then I wanted to read from this. This is from um, the seminary teacher manual. And I have not read this, but I wanted to just because it, it looked like it was saying some pretty interesting things. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat. Okay, explain that Gog was the king or chief prince of a land called Magog, located north of Jerusalem. Ezekiel used Gog symbolically to represent a wicked leader or leaders who will seek to destroy God's people in the last days. Write the word Jerusalem uh, in the center of the board. Write Gog of Magog above the word Jerusalem. Summarize Ezekiel 38, 4 through 6 by explaining that Ezekiel prophesied that Gog would assemble a great army for many, from many nations. Ask students to look in verse 5 for the, th for the three countries that would gather. Now remember, we were looking at another manual where it was talking about how most likely Magog would be composed of several countries. Uh, the whole world would be at war. And that all nations would in some way uh, be like in alliance against Israel, but not necessarily involved in the actual invasion of Israel. Um, okay. What countries gathered to Gog? Explain that ancient Persia, which is modern day Iran, by the way, which is interesting. Explain that ancient Persia was east of Jerusalem. Uh, ancient Ethiopia was south of Jerusalem. Hey, why don't we just look at this on the map? Why don't we look at this on the map? Let's go over here. Okay, so here's Israel, right? Persia is over here to the east. It's now called Iran. Um, the, the largest ethnic group in Iran, Iran, refer to themselves as Persians. Ethiopia is down here in the south. Okay, south of Israel. All right, and then let's get back to it. Uh, and ancient Libya was west of Jerusalem. Yeah, Libya is right here. Okay. Libya, Ethiopia, Persia. Ezekiel may have used these countries symbolically to illustrate that this army would come from many surrounding nations. Write the names of these countries on the board and draw arrows from them to Gog and Magog. Oh, I see. So you, they wrote. I was they were, the teacher supposed to write Gog of Magog up here north of Jerusalem, and then these countries uh, joining them. Okay. Uh, and who knows if there is a well? Yeah, maybe this country is Russia. You know. Uh, I talked about that a little bit a little bit recently. We know that Russia is currently uh, literally north of Israel right now. Uh, they're in Syria. The Russian military is still conducting operations here. In fact, clicking on that right there, Assad's force, this is two days ago, Assad's forces backed by Russia sorry, backed by Russia, bombard with heavy artillery the outskirts of the villages of Benin, Shannon, uh, Maj Majdalia, and Al-Ruya 
in the southern countryside of Idlib, Syria. Anyway, Russia is still operating here. Uh, they are literally north of uh, Israel. They, they told Israel, they were like, hey, just remember, we don't recognize the Golan Heights as yours or Jerusalem in that, you know, we side with with Syria. You know, and. Um, yeah, OK, so let's let's move on. Summarize Ezekiel 38, 17 through 14 by explaining that after the army of Gog gathers against the mountains of Israel, their purpose will be to attack uh, what they perceive to be the defenseless kingdom of Israel dwelling without walls. <clears throat> this prophecy refers to the great battle commonly referred to as the Battle of Armageddon, which will precede the second coming of Jesus Christ. Note, the battle at the end of the millennium described by John is also referred to as the Battle of Gog in Magog. The army of Gog symbolizes the great army that will attack Jerusalem. At a large arrow pointing down from Gog to Magog to Jerusalem to represent this attack. Invite a student to read Ezekiel 38, 15 through 16 aloud. Ask the class the, the, to follow along looking at the Lord's purpose in allowing the army of Gog to attack the people in Jerusalem in the latter days. What did the Lord say his purpose is, his purpose, sorry, what did the Lord say is his purpose in allowing Gog to, to battle the people of Israel? Oh, okay, let's read it. Um, and thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company, and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. And it shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. So, that the heathen may know the Lord? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, we, we know that when Christ comes, he's going to, the world's going to see it. They're, they're going to know that he's with Israel. <clears throat> um, Israel is going to going to receive the Lord, and then they're going to recognize that it's Christ when they get up close and can see the the marks in his hands and his feet. Okay. Um, ask the students to, to consider marking the phrase that the heathen may know me in verse 16. Explain that the word heathen refers to people who do not know the Lord. Further explain that the phrase I shall be sanctified in thee in verse 16 means the Lord will manifest himself as he sustains the people of Israel against the army of Gog. Um, yeah, let's just keep going. Divide students into groups of two or three and invite them to take turns reading aloud from Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, looking for how the Lord will demonstrate his power against the army of Gog. Um, according to verse 23, what will the many nations come to know as they, they witness the destruction of Gog? Uh, I think I'll just end it here. That's that's probably good enough. Okay. Now, uh, the last thing I wanted to share. Okay. I was thinking about how things can happen really quickly. Okay. How this final war could probably happen pretty quick. Um, I don't think I hold very firm to the time frames put in the book of Revelation because... I think some of them are symbolic, and um, I'm not going to rehash that now. I might do a, another video sometime why I think that is. But you can look at my playlist called Symbolism, where I go over symbolic numbers, including three and a half and what they mean um, in Judaism and in the church and stuff like that. So uh, in my mind and with my current understanding and in, in my current opinion, uh, which is always subject to change. I think that things could happen pretty quick. And uh, we learned that the great earthquake that's going to change the earth, the, the, the worldwide earthquake that happens uh, during this final war when Christ comes, 
uh, it happens at that time. It changes the whole earth, and and it would seem that maybe that's what the church is concerned about with these temples, uh, making sure that they're um, reinforced uh, for earthquakes. And so if that's the case, you know, I think a lot of people look at the renovation of the Salt Lake Temple and maybe think, well, maybe the second coming wouldn't happen until after it's all done, right? Uh, which right now, the current estimate is 2025. It used to be 2024, now it's 2025. But I wondered if maybe that's not the case. What if it happens before the renovation is complete, but after the earthquake reinforcement is complete? You get what I'm saying? Because it's not just... They're not just doing the earthquake reinforcement. They're doing the entire Temple Square as well as uh, the church office building area, that that uh, block. So if that's the case, if if maybe the Lord would wait until the Salt Lake Temple uh, has this seismic upgrade, um, I wanted to see where, where are we at? Where are we at with that process? So the most recent... I pulled up the two most recent articles. Okay. I have this one right here. Uh, this is church news. It's from October 1st. Okay. Um, but I also have this one that's from August 29th. And this one says crews reach key phase in seismic upgrade of historic Salt Lake temple. So, let me just read a little bit of this. Salt Lake City, Dakota Hansen is one of the crew members tasked with digging large horizontal holes underneath the Salt Lake Temple. And uh, I believe that's this right here in this picture, these these holes right here. This is called the, the jack and bore process, where they, um, you know, bore into this, they make a hole. And then they insert a pipe. Uh, that's part of the the system. Okay, he's making way for a four foot wide steel pipe that will fill the space he's clearing out. He is a part of what's known as the Jack and Boar method, which is being used this summer to lay 100 of these pipes underneath the foundation of the historic Salt Lake Temple to keep the building stable in an earthquake. Official uh, so church officials in their Friday update, said this is a quote-unquote key component in the lengthy process of seismically upgrading the 187 million pound temple that opened in 1893. And here's like a, a, a rendering, you know, a computer-generated rendering of what it looks like. Okay, here's the pipes going under there. Um, once in place, a cement... In a cement and sand-based grout is used to fill in the spaces between the pipes to ensure there isn't a gap between the foundation and new piping underneath it. Okay, so no gaps between the foundation and the piping underneath it. A rebar cage is also hauled, hauled in and inserted inside every pipe to make the pipe stronger. So going back up here, I think that's what this represents, this like cement. Like here's the rock or stony foundation, and then the cement connects the pipes with the foundation, and then there's rebar inside the pipes. Okay, one of the next steps is to run a set of cables through the temple walls that will connect the top of the building to the new pipe casting underground. So that's interesting. They're they're basically connecting the roof uh, to these pipes. Uh, it says this system will allow the building to move as quote unquote one solid structure uh, when there is an earthquake. Official said. So up here, these pipes. There can be cables going up through the walls of the temple all the way to the top, so that it's like just very securely. Uh, secured uh, to this new foundation here. That's really interesting. Um, 
Once the Jack and and Boar process is complete, Bone said, or Bane, I don't know, Bone, Bane, um, uh, a big and heavy, quote-unquote, concrete footing will be installed underneath the pipes. Close to 100 base isolators will be installed between the pipes and footing. Okay, so the footing underneath, but in between the pipes and the footing, uh, quote-unquote, base isolators. Uh, every one of these isolators can support 100 or 800 million pounds of weight serving as bearings during an earthquake. There's also a beam that will be installed to keep to keep and jack and bore pipes together for more support. So, um, I don't really know where we're at at this point, other than as of August 29th, it seemed like they were doing this. Oh, here's the rebar. This is the rebar that's going inside the pipes. Um, anyway, so this was, you know, this was now a couple months ago, because now we're at the end of, of October. So what I'm wondering is, you know, could it be that as soon as this is done, that great earthquake could take place? You know, um, I, I don't know. It's just something to think about. It's just something to think about. It could be that just as soon as that's completed, any time after that, potentially the earthquake could happen. And I don't know, maybe there would still be some damage to the temple. Uh, probably not. But I'm not so sure that the entire project would have to be complete uh, before that happens. Uh, the reason why I say that is because I really think that I I really, I really, uh, I always like remember this, this phrase from the scriptures, um, come at a time ye think not. Let me find it. Okay. So watch therefore. For this is in Matthew 24, verses 42 to 44. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. I think that we should take that seriously because, you know, there's a lot of us that study the second coming. Um, There's lots of different ways of picturing how it's going to happen. And uh, that that's why when I look at the book of revelation and it gives these like days and months and stuff like that, I'm not so sure that those are actual units of time rather than symbolic, because if they were literal time frames, that would make this scripture basically null and void. Because like I said, if we knew that the two witnesses were operating in Jerusalem, if we knew that, because I always get a lot of comments that say, well, hold on, we're we're getting a little ahead of ourselves because we haven't seen the two witnesses yet. Well, if we saw the two witnesses, then like I like I've said many times before, you could just mark on a calendar. Oh, they started on this date, and then it's going to be done in three and a half years. So that's when Christ is going to come. Um, or when it talks about, I don't know if it's talking about the siege on Jerusalem or if it's talking about the invasion of Israel. I can't remember, but one of those has uh, the time frame of forty-two months associated with it so you could do the same thing it's like oh israel's been invaded well we know that we have 42 months left and then so you see the problem with that and the same thing could be happening here um i think that for those that are watching you know we are watching we're prepared we're listening to the prophet and uh, and his wife and and general authorities and they all seem to be on the same page with the second coming is very soon, right? 
Whereas there might be others that are tempted to think, no, we still have a while. Uh, it's not going to happen before the Salt Lake Temple renovations are complete. Well, maybe that's the purpose. Maybe the Lord has it planned so that some people will be kind of um, have a false security, you know, because there, there's probably some that that they, they're just like, well, I'm not going to think about these things too much. I'm not going to be watching like he like we're commanded to. He commands us right here to watch. And there's some people that probably think, well, I need, I don't need to watch because all I need to know is that uh, this has to happen first. And then they stop watching or they don't, or they don't take it very seriously. It seems like there's a strong element of the second coming, not just for the wicked, but for us as well, that we, that it's going to happen when, when we're, when we don't think it's going to happen, it's going to happen uh, in such a way that you're supposed to be caught on your best behavior, you know, and then the wicked will be ca- will be caught in wicked behavior. But it seems like it's kind of like a time's up for everybody and that we're not supposed to know exactly when it happens. And that's not to say that the prophet won't know. We've read that quote from Joseph Smith saying that the prophet will know. I don't think that he'll tell us the exact hour. But I think he does know, and I think that he's dropping hints for those that are watching. And so we can kind of get a sense, but I still think that this scripture is absolutely true. You know, be ready for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. And there's a lot of people right now that are thinking not. They're like, no, it can't happen now because da 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 da. So I just think that we need to be careful with that. Otherwise, we're going to be caught unprepared. Um, but, you know, all we can really do is just wait and see. The, mo- the most important thing is to go to the temples that are currently not under renovation and um, make sure that we, we make our covenants if we haven't already. And if we have, go and do the work for the dead as well as get those spiritual blessings for ourselves of, of temple attendance, right? Keep our covenants, go to church, take the sacrament. We should be doing that every week, study the scriptures, uh, and listen to the prophet. So, all right, well, that's going to be it for this one. Hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it, and I'll talk to you guys later.